uh, quantum information, uh, quantum key distribution, quantum simulations, uh, all the way to nonlinear quantum optics. Uh, he's very well known for his work on limitations on practical quantum crypto cryptography, optical quantum memory, uh, efficient quantum algorithms for simulating sparse Hamiltonians. And the list is long, so let me stop here and uh, uh, and uh, tell you the title of his talk. So he's going to talk about uh, kittens, cats, and compasses, uh, superposing coherent states from quantum sensing, quantum communication, quantum computing, and quantum fun. And I think uh, we will be particularly looking forward to the quantum fun part of it. We'll learn what that is. Um, so welcome, Professor Berry, and uh, the stage is yours. Okay, thanks very much, Soren. Uh, yeah, so it's good to be here and, and be able to speak at this illustrious conference. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about quantum fun and other stuff. It's the first time I've given this a talk on this topic, so bear with me because uh, you know it's more spontaneous, less rehearsed. Um, so I'll be talking about just give you a general overview of Schrodinger kit, kittens, cats, and compasses. And then we have late breaking news, a paper that came out last month on the archive. And my PhD student, Pragati Gupta, is going to give a couple of slides. One of the nice things about being able to Zoom talk is um, instead of me talking by myself about students' work, I get a chance to showcase. And so in this case, I want to showcase what Pragati's what Pragati has done uh, with cat states, and it'll be on a nucleus, what we're working on. Okay, so let's get into it. Um, okay, uh, so I just want to take you through a bit of the history. It's it's a potted history of uh, the of what's going on with cats, cat states. And so, on the upper left, you can see this picture. Um, this picture is from Wikimedia, uh, the multimedia, well, the media behind the Wikipedia service, um, and. This is depicting Schrodinger's cat, and Schrodinger's cat is famously said to be in a superposition of dead and alive. Strictly speaking, there's entanglement involved. The cat's dead if the nucleus decayed, and the cat's alive if it didn't. So exactly what would be meant by Schrodinger cat states is subject to debate, but historically, we've tended to refer to Schrodinger cat states as a superposition of dead and alive. Um, this paper 10 slash DNP 93G refers to um, Schrodinger's paper on when he posed the cat paradox. And let me explain what this cryptic term means if you're not familiar with short DOI. So DOI, as you might know, is the digital object identifier. It's a way of identifying every digital object uniquely. And they offer a hash service. Hashing turns every DOI into a short form. Hash DOIs are given by 10 slash and then some up to six alphanumeric uh, symbols. And if you just go to doi.org and you enter this code, 10 slash DNP 93G, it's a shorthand for the DOI. So in doi.org, it will open up. Uh, I and Pragati, we're going to use this shorthand to refer to papers. So this is the original. Um, Schrodinger cat paradox paper and the Wikimedia depiction of it. And, it, and so we're going to take it in a historical way of a superposition of the cat being dead or alive. And that superposition technically is given by coherent states. So below um, this paper, Photon Correlations by Roy Glauber in 1963, this is in Physical Review Letters. The short DOI for this paper, if you want to look it up, is given here. And this paper has within it um, the introduction of the coherent state, sometimes optical coherent state or, um, or uh, harmonic oscillator coherent state. And this is the uh, essentially the paper and its follow-up that earned Roy Glauber a share of a uh, Nobel Prize in physics is introducing this coherent state and the insight it brings into um, quantum optics. And there's a whole story of why such a simple state turned out to be so important. Um, I won't give it here, but I did want to point out, and it's famously well known, that the first case of the coherent state was actually by Schrodinger himself 
Um, so this is the reference to Schrodinger's paper, I think in 1928, 10 slash BXQ G3T. And then here written in German uh, is talking about the um, commuting, the Pendelda Vellen group is the commuting wave packet, uh, wave mechanics over here. So it's the wave mechanics picture. And Schrodinger came up with a Gaussian wave packet that would follow the classical motion of the harmonic oscillator. And that is a coherent state or squeeze state. Um, squeeze states are generalizations of coherent states. And so it came up there. I'm not trying to say that Glauber's work was derivative of what Schrodinger did. Glauber certainly deserved a Nobel Prize for his uh, understanding the importance for coherent states in light related to detectors, um, sources, propagation, uh, and, and all kinds of things. Um, but historically, the first version of that state appears over here. So it's an interesting coincidence that uh, the work that we talk about here is based all, partly on Schrodinger's cat paradox and partly on the concept of a Gaussian wave packet that follows classical motion of the oscillator. Okay, so the idea now is to work with this state, to generalize it, and to be able to uh, find applications for it. And surprisingly, such a weird state turns out to be useful. So this slide, I just want to point out um, an early case of the Schrodinger cat state. And it's one that um, probably doesn't get enough attention, but it's an interesting paper. It came out of Russia in 1974, and it refers to even and odd coherent states. And so it takes the oscillator. And then this particular paper, uh, it introduces even and odd coherent states. So it's you think of it as the Schrodinger cat, and if Schrodinger's cat's in a superposition of alive and dead, it could be live state plus dead state or live state minus dead state or some other phase relation. So this paper is really saying even in odd coherent states is the superposition if, the, if it's a plus or a minus state. And then they go into some details and they throw in some group theory and it's an interesting mathematical paper, but you can see over here what happens. So there's a displacement operator, often called the Glauber displacement operator. And this is displacement in phase space by alpha, a complex number indicating um, a point in phase space. And so you have a superposition of displacement and anti-displacement. So, you know, a displaced cat would be alive and an anti-displaced cat would be dead. And we can make a sum or a difference of the two. And they introduce a hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine version of the displacement operator, which is an interesting notation, kind of cute. And then they define their alpha plus even coherent state and alpha minus odd coherent state in terms of the superposition, whether in their language, it's a hyperbolic cosine or hyperbolic sine of this Hamiltonian term, um, sum of A and A dagger. Okay, so um, that's kind of an early case. This paper is formal. You know, it just goes through, it goes through the formal properties. I like it, um, but I'm going to skip forward now to, uh, you know, kind of a rediscovery of this. And so Term, the rediscovery um, uh, sum came of about okay, in 1986 so by Yerke and Stoller. Um, now, if you read this paper, you'll see in the acknowledgments there that they acknowledge Jared Milburn amongst others for discussion. And so they report the cat state here. There's a superposition. You see a Gaussian, um, a Gaussian overposition. So this is a Gaussian centered around minus three. This is a Gaussian centered at three. And the superposition of being at position three and position minus three for the harmonic oscillator is um, looks like a mixture. You know, if you had, if you said it's probably probably fifty percent this Gaussian and probability of that one, you'd see the same thing. But then they point out that if you look at the momentum distribution, you get interference fringes. So it's in the interference packet is centered around zero because here this is position three, position minus three with Gaussian distributions um, and uh, zero momentum up to the uncertainty principle, the width of the Gaussian in momentum space. And then this, um, uh, interference term is showing that the that in the momentum distribution there'd be interference effects some momentum would be accentuated and some would be absent and there'd be some period to this the phase of this interference 
is related to this even odd coherent state concept. And um, this state actually appears in Milburn's paper a few months earlier that I understand, I, I, you know, I, I remember, I'm old enough to remember those days in the conversations and Yerkin and Stoller were partly inspired by that paper. So Milburn's paper has the first appearance of uh, the cat state in, in this sense of it, of analyzing in terms of these Gaussian wave packets and studying position momentum properties. But Milburn didn't highlight that. It appears in one of his figures, but it's not discussed in the paper. And then Yerkin and Stoller, I believe, recognized the importance of that particular state. This um, uh, shows, this is from, I, I lifted that from a source. So I'm using bit.ly to shorten the URL, the universal resource locator. So if you go to that bit.ly address, you'll find that animation, it's a GIF file. And over here, you can see that there's a Gaussian, this is a phase space. So a Gaussian at a position, a Gaussian at the opposite position, it's rotating like a harmonic oscillator should. And in the center, you see interference. And the interference fringes have the property that these, they're kind of like when the two uh, states line up on the x-axis, it's horizontal lines. So you can see it's an interference and momentum space, and these fringes will shift depending on the phase relation between the coherent state and the and, uh, coherent anti-state, the cat alpha and the cat negative alpha. So that's the idea here. And then Yerkin Stoller wrote this paper. They used the same... Um, evolution that Milburn uses based on a kernel linearity, and they study interesting properties. But even in 1986, this was all kind of science fiction at the time. And, and in those days, which I remember, um, you know, it was really just fun to play with because it was coherent states that represented as close as classical you can get. And then you could superpose these things and everything became weird. So it became, it's kind of like the opposite of a qubit, a two level system. It became interesting to play with these things. And I played with them a lot myself. Um, and then I'll show you as I get through this presentation that they turned out to be experimentally feasible and they turned out to be useful. And this is total shock to me. Nobody at the time intended for these to be useful. So one of the early papers to uh, develop the Schrodinger cat state, making the cat, let me just go back the slide. So here you see there's a separation. So we have a Gaussian and a Gaussian, and the Gaussian tail falls off rapidly, so the overlap of the two Gaussians is almost zero. And this is important, that's what they mean here by um, macroscopically distinguishable states, and this will come up later in the talk again, but the macroscopic distinguishability is intuitively that the overlap between the two Gaussians is small. Interference effects are large at the, at a, at the center in the momentum direction, but the overlap being small means that we can say that this state is distinguished, distinct from that state, just like, you know, the cat alive and dead, there's not much overlap between being alive and being dead in, in this sense. So then in this paper, um, Philippe Granger's group in France uh, introduced the idea of a kitten. So a kitten has the property that the overlap is no longer negligible. And making it making a superposition of macroscopically distinct states turns out to be a challenge. So having a small overlap, uh, having allowing some overlap, they decided to make the term kittens for it. And they say here, uh, free propagating light pulse prepared in a Schrodinger kitten state, which is defined as a quantum superposition of classical coherent states with small amplitudes. So the width of the coherent state is fixed. So if the amplitude gets small, the overlap becomes larger. And then they say here, the kitten state is generated by subtracting one photon from a squeeze vacuum beam, and it clearly presents a negative Wigner function. So, you know, I, I'm not going to go through all the math. I'll say things here, and then, you know, I can leave it as homework to look it up. But the, the squeeze vacuum beam is a superposition of even number photons. So zero, two, four six, eight, and so on. And then it turns out that the amplitudes of each of the even number photons, it's given by the square root of the thermal distribution. Thermal distribution is the Planck distribution. And if you take the square root and plug it in as an amplitude in, in a superposition and you leave out every odd state, that's what you get. And then when you annihilate a photon, they subtract a photon from it, 
roughly it can say that you annihilate the vacuum and then your two becomes one and your three becomes two, sorry, two becomes one, four becomes three, so on. And then what they do, they then argue that by subtracting a photon from the squeeze vacuum, it's close to the Schrodinger kitten that they want. Um, this, uh, nowadays we're, we're much more direct about making cat states, but the early success was to make an entirely different state and then be able to argue that that entirely different state is, is close to being a cat. Uh, Professor Sanders, can I interrupt you once here? Sure. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. Just to go. So this is, uh, I remember in superconductivity also, we see something similar in a sense that, you know, Cooper pairs, you superpose zero, which is the vacuum, then two electrons, four electrons, six electrons, and there's a full hierarchy of the superposition. And then on the, on the even parity sector, on the odd parity sector, you have one excess electron, which is excited, and then you have all the superpositions. So is there an experiment on the solid state side using this fact or I'm just curious, you know, it's very similar somehow. Yeah, um, so I don't know of any experiments that connect Cooper pairs. There are a lot of experiments on now on these um, uh, cat states with superconductivity that I'll, I'll discuss a bit later, but um, what you're recognizing with superposition of even numbers of Cooper yes, the parity. Okay. Using the, there's something called the fermion parity and people use the fermion parity now as a qubit. And there's lots of motivation to use fermion parity as a qubit. And yes. then, uh, I'm curious that uh, did it find application here? I, okay. Just, just to curiosity. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the mathematical link is that Cooper pairs and the BCS theory uh, relate to the Bogolubov transformation and yeah, squeeze yeah. vacuum state. So when we do squeezing, um, and we have like a harmonic oscillator, we have A's and A daggers, um, say, uh, if we do a two harmonic oscillator, we have A's and B's, then the squeezing mm -hmm. operation can be thought of as a Bogolubov transformation, and that creates the mm -hmm. pairs. So the link between squeeze vacuum having even number and Cooper pairs is strong through the mathematics of the Bogolubov transformation. So that's valid. Um, the parity idea on the fermions there, there's whether I don't know of that being a strong area of research at the moment because there are many ways to manifest qubits and some of it comes down to not just whether you know it's possible but there's a lot of uh, competition to build quantum computers so whichever one wins depends on you know the physics and the engineering of those devices. I hope that's that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So one more very quick question. In the previous sure. slide, when you showed this uh, position distribution and the momentum distribution, does it automatically mean that if at the center, let's say you really have a state where the wave function practically goes to zero at the center, then mm -hmm. does it mean that even if you are plotting this momentum distribution, it's impossible to measure because I will never find the particle there. So, so is there a, does it mean that I have to really work very, very hard? The statistics is going to be much harder. Well, so if, yeah, um, and I'll get to this where, uh, uh, you know, that, that we're up, up past 100 photon cat states. So in that case, um, the amplitude, if, the, if it were 100, the square root of 100 is 10. So the amplitude would go up to 10 and minus 10. The width mm -hmm. is order one. So mm -hmm. the overlap is, is very tiny, you know, um, you know, negligible part of 1%. So um, in that case, you can say, well, you know, the probability of ever seeing the particle at a position around zero is negligible. But then you say, okay, like imagine that's a harmonic oscillator. So think of a pendulum swinging, right? And then yeah. you have a superposition where the pendulum has swung to the right and the pendulum has swung to the left. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the momentum is centered at zero. So it tells you that the momentum averages to zero, but that kind of makes sense because they're, you know, superposition of right and left. So the velocities might cancel out, but then there's the uncertainty principle. So if you had the, the pendulum has swung to the right and it's got some uncertainty where it is exactly, then there's uncertainty in the momentum. What's interesting here is that you say, now I have a superposition of the pendulum swung to the right and swung to the left. And then you say, what is the momentum? It's centered at zero, 
but then it interferes. So then back to your question, it's not the, what would be interesting then is you, you create that state and then mm. you measure the average momentum, not the average, you measure the momentum instant to instant, not the average, you collect data on the momenta mm. because of the uncertainty principle, it won't be zero, it'll have spread, but then mm. it will have an oscillation um, on the scale of one, which means- Yes, that's my point. Is the yeah. data, the expectation value of the size of standard deviation? Can I trust this? Plot well, if you can measure at single photon level yeah. and there's no decoherence in the system, you can trust it. And then okay. in language phase space, which I'll come to in compass states, uh, mm. that interference uh, that interference period is known as the Planck scale for phase space. Okay. okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Sure. So yeah, it's quantum fun here, so. Okay, the next one that I want to get to, so I, I told you about the um, optical case and there's a few photons, but it's not really cat states. It's an approximation by another means. Here, the now um, years later, we get to a point where it's possible to make cat states. And this blew me away when it happened because you know, if you asked me years earlier, I would have said, no, we're never going to see it. And so, and I would have been wrong. Um, so this paper, which was published in Science in 2013, says it's deterministically encoding quantum information using 100 photon Schrodinger cat state. So 100 photon, as I said, square root would be um, size of 10 here. And then, um, but it goes further. They actually say here 111. So square root of 100 is 10. Square root of 121 is 11. You know, roughly 10 and a half photons. Um, and so this group. Um, based at Yale University, point out, so they point out like instead of a quantum bit, a qubit, uh, they talk about the oscillator. So you can think of the pendulum swinging, as I said, and um, this is, and going back to your question, Soren, it's the superconducting transmon qubit. So in a way we're making use of, of uh, superconductivity to be able to make these things, but um, it in actually, yeah, I won't go into the details, but, um, we're making the superconducting systems are allowing us to make cat states, but it's not in the electrons. These are photons. So there are microwave photons inside of cavities. There's a picture down here where it says cavity one, transmon qubit, cavity two, cavity coupler. Transmon qubit is a sophisticated version of a charge qubit where if the charge is on the left, it's a zero, charge on the right is a one, and you can make a superposition of charge on the left and right. And then they make use of a dispersive coupling with the cavity. So it turns out that depending on which state the transmon is in, um, the field, the oscillator, the, which is the microwave field in a particular mode, changes like changes like harmonic oscillator. So the phase shifts. So uh, actually, I'll go back. I'll show you that picture. So you kind of say, well, you know, the cat is spinning around, but then what you do is entangle it with this charge qubit. So depending on where the charge sits, the rate of, of uh, rotation changes and they make use of that and measure qubit to be able to prepare the cat state. So there's a lot of details in here, but that's essentially what's going on with that whole circuit. And then they say, we mapped an arbitrary qubit state. So that's the charge qubit left or right to a superposition of coherent states known as a cat state. Amazing, 111 uh, photons and uh, you know, it's really definitive. There's no question in anybody's minds that we really do have cat states, which were science fiction back even in the 80s and 90s. Okay, um, so some work I did, I, I was involved with cat state stuff. Um, and then back in the, some year, uh, I think around 90, 92, 1992, um, I got interested in uh, generalizing these to um, more than one mode. So our, it could be a two-dimensional harmonic oscillator. It could be, uh, two-mode field and going even beyond that. Um, so I worked on that in 1992 and wrote a paper called Entangled Coherent States. And then as things go um, over the years, I started to realize that what I did wasn't new at all. That, uh, you know, if I started looking back, I could, you know, see hints of all this coming much earlier historically. And so I was invited to write a review back uh, around 2011 for this 2012 special issue. So I have a review paper on entangled coherent states. And this one 
goes into cat states where there's two or more oscillators or two or more modes. And what I found was that, you know, studying the history carefully, the um, history went back to 1967, the earliest use. And the earliest use of uh, cat states was in, uh, it was by, oh my goodness, Aharonov and Saskind, both famous physicists. And um, they, they were addressing the following question. And I, I find this a lot. So I'm a, I become a very quantum optics slash quantum information person. Um, and, but my master's degree, I started off in particle physics. And there's a cultural difference between particle physics and say quantum optics slash quantum information. We like superpositions in, in the fields I work in, but in particle physics, there's a tendency to say, it wouldn't make sense to have a, a superposition of a quark and an electron or this and that. Like the quantum numbers that identify particles in a way um, set them apart. And Aharonov and Suskind wrote back in 1967, they said, um, what is it that makes us think that we can't have superposition of charges, we can't have superposition of angular momentum or whatever. And then they wrote a paper on charge superselection. And they, in their paper, saying that, there, that the particle physics concept of charge superselection is built on an, uh, an implicit belief that, um, that there's no resource. So there's a whole area now in this quantum resource theory now. And quantum resource theory is all about the question of, you know, how much resource do we need to prove a superposition exists? So a cat state, you can say we, um, you could say cat states are impossible. You know, life and death are objectively distinct. And then in quantum resource theory, you tie this to whether the resource exists to be able to even see a superposition of life and death. And if you go back to the Aharonov and Suskind paper back in 1967, you can see the mathematics of these entangled coherent states. And so I wrote about it. it and, and so it's interesting, this then had the application of being able to separate super selection principles in particle physics from the axioms of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And then, um, yeah, so this was 67 to 72 is five years. 40, yeah, it was five, 45 years. So it's a 45 year history of entangled coherent states. And then it's interesting here. So, um, I, okay, so I, went, I told you about this cat state in 2013. And here's the group again, it's Sholkoff's group. Team has grown somewhat. And there's a paper that, the, a paper that also came out in science back in 2016. And this paper, they call the Schrodinger cat living in two boxes. And you can see here, I took a bit of a quote. It says, um, alternatively, in the more natural eigenmode basis has been known as the entangled coherent states in theoretical studies. This refers to my paper on the previous slide and may be understood as two single cavity cat states, blah, blah, blah. But essentially, in my way of thinking, it says like in theoretical studies, I'm a theorist. So to me, this is the about making an entangled coherent state. Amazing. Again, this is with science fiction stuff. And through a system that I won't go through here, but there's the key point is that there's two coaxial cavities. So there's two cavities for photons to live in. Then they made a Schrodinger cat state in two modes, or in other words, an entangled coherent state. And then they go on and they argue, like they talk about a two mode cat state, um, entangled pair of single cavity cat states. And then they talk about this exceeding 100 dimensions. So, you know, if you have 100 photons, you have 101 dimensional space. So they're still, they're able to make this entangled coherent state at the same scale that they were able to make the cat state before. Actually, oh, 100 dimensions, yeah. So it's, it could be 10 in one space, 10 in the other, and the tensor product of two 10 dimensional Hilbert space, 100. Yeah. So it's consistent with what they did before, but being able to do it in two cavities. So that was a science paper. Um, amazing work, as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, Okay, so now we can, we're starting to see that, you know, as of 2013, and 2016, cat states and entangled coherent states are, are feasible in superconducting systems. Okay, so what are they good for? Well, um, the, this one, I, I, I go back to this paper. Um, this paper is called Macroscopically Distinct Quantum Superposition States as a Bosonic Code for Amplitude. I didn't study enough before giving this talk. I told you it's the first time I'm giving uh, this uh, talk on this particular general topic. 
Um, but my memory is that this is the paper that first introduced bosonic codes. And so the idea of bosonic codes is that you have um, uh, an electromagnetic field, you know, photons. And then the bosonic code is some way of dealing with them. So instead of talking about as photons, we talk about them as bosons. And then we want to be able to encode it. And they said, let's encode it as a Schrodinger cat state. Well, this goes back to the even and odd coherent state, which are orthogonal to each other. So a cat state with a plus sign in the superposition is orthogonal to the cat state with the minus sign. And then they say, they should they explain theoretically that this protects against bit flip errors. So the problem with the cat state, uh, with the states is that they're very sensitive to even loss of a single photon, as we talked about a little while ago with the, you know, those interference fringes and momentum are single photon size. So losing a photon will flip the sign. And then what they point out is that they can make codes that will protect against, protect against those kinds of errors. That was protecting the, um, the bosonic code for qubit. And then I worked with that team uh, a couple of years later. And then you can see, so there's Monroe and Milburn, Monroe and Milburn and Cochrane swapped over to me. And then um, we just showed how if you use this kind of code, then it's entangled coherent states that are the um, manifestation of the two qubit system. And so you use that code, you have to make entangled coherent states as a consequence of your two qubit gates. So that was the work. So this was back, um, you know, the last century. And not long after, so this was um, 98 and 2000, then a very exciting paper came out out of, out of uh, well, John Preskill's group, sort of. Um, Alexei Kitayev, who has been at Caltech for many years, John Preskill's at Caltech. Dan Gottesman was, at, was Preskill's student at Caltech. So I think of this like a Caltech origin paper. And in this case, they want to encode a qubit and an oscillator. But instead of making a cat, they make what I call a comb state, and everybody else in the universe calls a GKP state after the authors. So I'm going to say comb state and be obstinate, even though it's perfect. If you say comb state, nobody will understand you, and you say GKP state, they will. I'm at the point now where I can get up and talk about comb states, and just because I'm so pushy on it, people understand me. But um, the idea here, the reason I think of it as a comb is these are this. Think of this as a Gaussian, but a very, very thin Gaussian squeeze state. And this is another one. So if you had two of these superposed, you could have a cat and you could make encode it as a zero. And then in the cat state code, you would take that and then you would change the sign and have this minus this, and then you would have the one. But these guys cleverly proposed the following. They said, imagine you had a superposition of coherent states um, at separations of two alpha. So if alpha uh, alpha is just some sort of amplitude, it gives you a scale for this comb, um, then, and you went on forever, then the superposition of infinitely many coherent states equally spaced. Um, so to me, the, there's a comb, and I refer to these as the teeth of the comb. So infinitely many equally spaced teeth in, in uh, position space would be a zero. Then they said, now let's displace it. So we now move the comb. So every tooth is in the gap of the other comb and we make that a one. And then they point out that if you superpose zero and one, then you wind up with a comb. Uh, oh, sorry, I have to be careful here. Um, yeah, this is a Hadamard transformation. So when you do the superposition, you apply a Hadamard transformation and then you wind up with a comb that has a different spacing, two pi and alpha. And if you uh, displace it, it shifts by half. So they said, suppose that you um, created, uh, you, you started to doing quantum information processing where your zero is a comb, your one is a comb, and the Hadamar just changes the spacing of the comb. Um, then they pointed out how this would behave as, an, as a, a correctable code. So the cat state trying to get universal quantum error correction is not so straightforward, but you get the full story over here. And then they go on. And of course, you know, this infinite comb of infinitesimally thin, you know, perfectly squeezed states is not possible. So then they analyze in the paper, they say, what if you had um, imperfect ones? So it's now coherent states or squeeze states with some width. And the comb now has some fall off, which is necessary. 
And it turns out, and, and companies like Xanadu in Toronto are, are building these things now. So the analysis is that if you can get seven good teeth in the comb, you can get scalable quantum error corrections the way that it goes. So now this whole idea of superpositions of current states is so significant that it, you know, it even underlies the current uh, strategy being engaged in by a company, a billion dollar company like Xanadu. Okay, so that tells you about quantum computing, but it's also interesting for um, communication. I, I brought up one of several papers. So this paper from Masita Sasaki's group um, is a, a paper in Nature Photonics, which is quantum teleamplification with a coherent uh, continuous variable superposition state. So essentially what they're saying is, you know, if if you have cat states over here, there's a cat state over here. They point out, they say, um, if you want to teleport coherent states, then you can make use of, of uh, you can make use of cat states to perform a resource for being able to teleport. So the message here is, um, is that we're able to move towards quantum metrology, quantum repeaters, the whole thing of quantum networks by making use of optical cat states. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think that's all I want to say on this one. But uh, you can see in this diagram how it's going to work. There's Alice, there's Bob, and then there's a measurement here sent over. And Bob winds up with some copy of what Alice sent. And then there's some scaling. The, it's a superposition of coherent states that could have smaller amplitude. OK, the next one I want to talk about, and this will tie back into quantum computing, is there was a paper back in 2001 by Zurek at uh, Los Alamos National Lab in the US. And what he said is um, the, the idea, and this is what we talked about earlier. So we talked about a cat state and then the cat state per position has these momentum interference and it has a fringe spacing of one, which is Planck scale. But then Zurek said, suppose that you had a superposition of four coherent states. And he talks about these as compass state. And the reason it's the compass is this state's in the north, that's the south, that's the east, and that's the west, which is written down in the figure caption. And then you look at the phase space interference fringes at the center, and you can see that there's an oscillation which is finer than the single photon level. And so that's what Zurek means by subplank structure in phase space. And what he argues, he says here, um, imply that phase space structures associated with subplank scales do not exist or do not matter. I show this as false. Non-local quantum superpositions or Schrodinger cat states confined to a phase space volume characterized by classical action A can achieve a scale of H bar squared over A. So he's pointing out that he can make structure in phase space smaller than, than, smaller than what would have been assumed naively, these kinds of theories. So the idea of compass state then ties to sensing. The argument is, that if you can get that subplank structure in phase space, and I, you know I talked about the oscillating pendulum, um, right? So there's there's some resolution to those fringes, but now the idea is that you can actually conceive of learning structure that's even finer than the Planck scale. So that's the idea over here. Um, I I've done a fair bit of work on compass states since, but I didn't include those in this presentation. Um, but I it's kind of like the compass states were very interesting. They shifted over to bosonic codes. People lost, stopped thinking about them in quantum sensing. And then uh, I and some of my collaborators or students, we and postdoc, we, we found ways to be able to explore these more. Okay, um, so now I want to move on to say there's more than the Schrodinger Glauber coherent state. And there was a beautiful paper back in 1971 in communications and mathematical physics by the Russian mathematical physicist Perelimov. And he wrote a paper called Coherent States for Arbitrary League Group. He later wrote a book a few years later, which is one of my favorite books. It's a well-written, and I remember being a postdoc and learning about um, Coherent States for League Groups. And it was, you know, it, it was really enjoyable to read it. Very well-written book. So Perelimov just says, well, you know, if we can have coherent states, um, and, and there was work that came out about a year or two earlier on what were called atomic coherent states, which turned out to be states for SU2 symmetry, which Perelimov talks about. So motivated by that as well, he then started to analyze the idea of having um, generalized groups. And he deals with compact and non-compact groups. 
And then this idea, once you say, okay, there's coherent states associated with different group symmetries, then there's going to be cat states and compass states and all this kind of stuff. So there's a whole rich direction to be able to go on a fun, fun mathematical physics way of thinking to explore them. And so Perlamov's idea on arbitrarily groups and coherent states helps. Um, so I like that back in 1989, I did, I had this particular work you can see in the upper left. This picture is from that work. And it's essentially saying, um, and this will come up when Prakati gives her part of the presentation is, um, uh, so what I looked at back then is to say, okay, let's play with SU2 coherent states and superpose them. And I just took Milburn's idea of a, what is often called a kernel linearity, translated it over to the nuclear domain, which has a quadratic linearity that, quadra that uh, Pragati will mention. And if you just take the block sphere, Northern hemisphere, do a stereographic projection of uh, the quasi probability distribution on it and let it evolve, the initial coherent state looks like, like a Gaussian peak. It's actually a binomial peak that's then stereographically projected to the plane. It evolves, there's interference fringes and phase space that start to appear. And then later you wind up with the superposition of a SU2 coherent state here and an SU2 coherent state there. So it's possible to generate, and that's something Pragati will exploit in what she talks about for our nuclear result. And then, as I said, you can, so that's the cat state for SU2. And then you can make entangled coherent states more general. And this is the paper way back in 2000, SU2 and SU11 symmetries. Um, okay. And so this was just fun stuff. Most of the world didn't care about it, but then with bosonic codes and other stuff, it's become interesting. Okay. So this slide is allowing me to just bridge over to what Pragati is saying. So I'll explain this slide and then I'm going to pass over to her. Um, and, and I'll handle the slides as she does it. And so here's the idea in, in simple terms that um, we decided that we wanted to would make what I like to say is the biggest cat on the smallest object. And so we're working in, we're, we're um, working with an experimental group at the University of New South Wales led by Andrea Morello. The work we've done so far with them is theoretical. And then the idea is that we're dealing with the nucleus. And so here's a nucleus. It's a collection of protons and neutrons that are bounded together by the strong nuclear force. So you can think of it as a rigid body and it has spin, right? And so the antimony nucleus that Pragati will talk about has uh, spin seven halves. So it's an eight dimensional Hilbert space. And so it can have a spin of seven halves clockwise, spin of seven halves um, counterclockwise and the cat state. And that relates to what I showed over here is a superposition of the cat spinning uh, clockwise and counterclockwise. But even more important in what we do is we can adjust the axis. So we make, we can, you can tell us, say, I want it to be a superposition of clockwise and counterclockwise along an axis of your choosing, and we're able to make it. So we're not just making it with respect to one direction, but we're able to make it in any direction. And so in that case, using, um, cats with angular momentum and using the standard nuclear variables, we have the Casimir label of I, the spin of I. So this would be like spin seven halves for a, a spin half, seven halves nucleus. And this would be the upper, the highest spin. And this would be the lowest spin. And then that's the superposition of the two. And uh, we don't bother to use normalization if it's implied. So the root two is not shown explicitly. Okay, so Pragati, are you able to be visible? I'm unable to switch on my video probably because I'm, oh, I am. You're okay. Fine. It's, yeah. Okay. okay. Next slide. I'll, I'm just going to mute and then I'll do next slide. Okay. Hi. So to implement this uh, nuclear spin cat state that Barry just mentioned, we uh, consider uh, a solid state device. So our device is shown on the figure at the very left. So here you see uh, it's a silicon-based chip and which has a high spin donor, which is a group five element, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, bismuth, or antimony, uh, which one of these, which is impl implanted in this, inside this nanometer scale chip. And this chip has uh, fabricated gates and uh, 
electrodes on the top of it. So there are electrostatic gates uh, that control the potential of this high spin nu nucleus. Uh, so at the very beginning of the experiment, uh, a high spin donor, which is a group five element, has five electrons in its outermost shell. But we only want to control the nuclear spin. So we uh, we can ionize the donor and remove an electron from the outermost shell so that we just have the nuclear spin for control. So this is done using the electrostatic gates. Then there is a, a microwave antenna, the big thing that fans out to the right and the left at the bottom of the chip, which is which can supply either magnetic or electric pulses. So a standard NMR technique, but uh, sort of extrapolated to a high spin nucleus. And then there's a SET, which stands for single electron transistor. So for readout, uh, we it's very hard to interact with a nuclear spin. Uh, so we bring back an electron, which interacts with the nuclear spin, and then we read out the state of the electron, and then infer the nuclear spin state based on the electron spin. So uh, as I mentioned, there are five electrons in the outermost shell. We ionize one of them. And silicon is a group four element. So it has four electrons in its outermost shell. So there are four electrons in an ionized donor, and there are four electrons in uh, that is four, uh, sorry, there are four bonds that it will form with the nearest neighbor uh, silicon atoms. Uh, and be because of the electrostatic potential that we are applying in the nucleus, in the lattice, these bonds get distorted and they create an electric field gradient. Now, an interesting property of a high spin nucleus is that it's not spherical. Uh, it's actually either ellipsoid or uh, in this direction or uh, in the vertical direction. And this creates uh, asymmetric charge distribution and it has a non-zero quadrupole moment. So if we consider the energy levels of this high spin nucleus, uh, say for example, a spin seven and a half would have eight uh, electron, eight energy levels, uh, but they are unequally shifted because uh, unlike in the case of Zeeman splitting, where they would have equal energy difference between all the different energy levels, the quadrupole shift would make it possible to address each of them individually. So this makes the whole system uh, very addressable, as in we can control all the eight dimensions and not restrict to just an SU2 kind of a system. Uh, by your next slide, please. Uh, sorry, uh, just a second. Uh, can you please go back? Yeah, so the uh, link that is shown uh, in very short DOI notation is uh, 10 slash J86J. Uh, this refers to uh, the nature paper by Andre Morello, uh, who uh, they demonstrated a control of this antimony nucleus uh, in the silicon based chip, uh, where they were able to find all the eight levels and uh, manipulate them using both magnetic and electric pulses. Yeah, next paper. Next slide, please. So uh, because of this quadrupole interaction, the quad, uh, which has a nonlinear nature, a uh, spins uh, coherent state on the block sphere, which is shown on the bottom left uh, first uh, phase space plot, uh, evolves to a cat state. Uh, so as Barry mentioned in his paper, when there's a nonlinearity uh, in a slide, uh, two slide, two or three slides back, when there's a nonlinearity in the system, a coherent state uh, eventually forms two blobs instead of one. So this figure shows that there's a coherent state on the axis, and that coherent state eventually squeezes and uh, spreads apart or spreads out on the equator. And so two components tear apart, forming a cat state. So this is generally called one axis twisting or two axis counter twisting. In our case, uh, we consider one axis twisting uh, because the quadrupole coupling is too small for uh, a, quad, a non uh, for a two count two axis counter twisting. So uh, this paper uh, ten slash ccbx nb talks is is the paper by it's a milestone paper by Kitagawa and Ueda in 1993 who uh, discussed uh, one axis twisting for a spin system. So uh, this uh, this paper, oh, sorry, this figure on the top left shows uh, the evolution of something called uh, and the effective size of the system. So it's a measure of macroscopicity based on the quantum fish information. So, for, so there are different measures for macroscopicity of a, a system. For a spin system, uh, a measure based on quantum fish information makes sense. 
for two reasons. One, uh, you have a finite dimensional system, which unlike these coherent states, you can uh, actually completely uh, measure and see what's control all the dimensions and so on. And two, uh, quantum fish information is also very important for uh, parameter estimation and metrology. So, which is an, a use for cat states. So we use this as a measure and we see that the size of a cat state uh, scales with the size of the nuclear spin. So uh, if you have a spin seven half cat state that is equivalent to uh, a cat state with seven atoms for or seven qubits. So uh, in our case, uh, this means that for you can have cat states that are equivalent to up to spin nine half, uh, which means a cat state equivalent to nine atoms. So this figure on the top left shows a coherent state which has an R effective of one and it increases in size uh, as it squeezes to a cat state and the very top uh, the maximum height is the cat state uh, that achieves the maximum value and we see that so arsenic has a spin three half uh, bismuth could have uh, spin high enough and everything in between we see how the size increases yeah next slide please so uh, the, the main challenge in uh, implementing such a uh, CAD state on a practical device is one, you can't uh, initialize to an arbitrary state. Uh, you're restricted to energy eigenstates of the system. And two, because of, uh, we, we, we like the quadrupole coupling that it creates this nonlinear interaction, but it also makes it hard to control all the eight dimensions of a system. So we devised a new technique, uh, which, is, which we call a multi-tone pulse which rotates a nuclear spin, uh, controlling all the seven transitions at the same time. So instead of uh, given rotations, which address just two levels at a time, we, uh, address, we drive all transitions at the same time, rotating the nuclear spin by 90 degrees or whatever angle you want. So our scheme looks as follows. We rotate, the, uh, we apply this multi-tone pulse uh, uh, for, to create a global rotation of pi by two. Then we wait for the coherent state uh, to squeeze to a gas state on the equator. And then we rotate it again using these uh, multi this multi-tone pulse to create a gas state on the uh, axis, on the polar axis. So the figure on the right, uh, so we expect to see something very similar to the previous image where a coherent state uh, goes to a gas state and the plot increases and decreases. But if we do the same thing, we see these uh, this purple, uh, plot which has very fast oscillations uh, because because of the so when the cat state is created it not just uh, squeezes it's also processing because of the Lamer uh, procession and uh, so we modulate the pulse uh, the phase of this pulse to so that the axis of rotation rotates with the uh, uh, rotation of the cat state so the black line uh, has a phase difference of uh, pi by two plus omega t, where omega is the frequency of Lama precession. And then we are able to observe this uh, death and revival. So death means that you started with a coherent state, which is at time t is equal to zero. You created a cat state, uh, which is the maximum uh, you can have. And then it goes to zero again, and it increases again. So the going from a cat state uh, to a coherent state is, is the death. And then the second peak is the revival of the cat state. So it is used to measure uh, the coherence of the cat state. Yeah, next slide. And back to Barry. Uh, somehow. Uh, yeah, somehow. Yeah. No, I, I muted and then I forgot I muted. So, yeah, yeah, okay. okay, thanks, Pragati. And um, yeah, so I'm just drawing conclusions and rather than write them out, I'll just say, you know, we, um, so the purpose of this talk was to fill you in on the history of cat states and their generalizations and their applications and how to have fun with them. And then the um, last bit is the new work. And so this is work that Pragati and I are doing with Andrea Morello's group at the University of New South Wales to turn nuclear spins into cats. So that's the summary. Thanks for listening to us. Talk. Uh, I will say educational for some of us. 
um, <laughs> and it was indeed fun. I think this idea of uh, having your student also to talk inside, this is the first time I saw it and it seemed Anybody has any question? Please unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, uh, Sorin, I have a small question. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, see, Barry, uh, you know, this tech could be uh, affected by decoherence, no? This uh, nuclear. Um, yeah, the, yes, the nuclear uh, cat would be affected by decoherence. Part of, um, with Pragati doing the multi tone pulse, this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the idea of using multi-tone control is to make the dynamics fast enough that we can realize things before decoherence sets in. But these are tiny objects and they're remarkably coherent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice. One more, one more question. So I saw Pragati calculating only uncertainty. Why would you call it Fisher information? Because your calculation was Ix square average minus I average square, really. Let's put her on the spot. Yeah. So uh, for, uh, for, for pure states, quantum fish information reduces to the variance. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And also for squeeze state, eh? Yes. For, yeah. uh, yes, for any, as long as we are not dealing with uh, decoherence, like we're not explicitly talking about uh, decoherence, then we're talking about uh, Fisher information in terms of the variance. Really wonderful. Thanks a lot. Very nice. Yeah. Thank, thanks for remembering uh, our discussion, Ramara Rai. Uh -huh. uh, any other questions? Okay. If not, I have a small question regarding this. I remember this, this kind of experiment you know, done in the context of Tudeg by Charlie Marcus and so on. They were really dealing with, so essentially they had quantum dot qubits using electrons. And then the nuisance was coming from the nuclear spin because the nuclear spin was taking away this was dephasing essentially. So what they did, they first pumped and nuclear completely polarized the nuclear spin, and then with the polarization time of the nuclear spin, they were doing quantum dot, uh, you know, the qubit uh, operations uh, with the electrons. Now here it seems like you are directly doing it with uh, not with electrons. So electrons is a nuisance here. See there, I, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that there the electrons were the main thing. The nucleus was a nuisance. And they had to polarize the nucleus before they could do something meaningful with the electrons. Now, you have a reverse approach where you have uh, this nucleus, nucleus being made the main player. Is the electrons, are there mobile electrons around? And are there, is, there an, is that a nuisance? And you need to deal with that? Um, so, uh, the electrons, uh, I'll just quickly answer and then back by you can. So, the electrons uh, are a nuisance uh, if if they do couple to the electron spin, but uh, to the nuclear spin, but if you uh, for the if you just ionize them and the electrons that remain near the nucleus, if they form the bonds, they are not uh, a nuisance. But Barry, I guess you wanted to. I see. I see. I see. Oh, you're doing fine. Okay. Go ahead. I see. And, and the um, other question is uh, the core. when you talked about quadrupole moment, these are so you also have spin quadrupole moment, but you are only talking about the electrical quadrupole moment at the moment, right? So the moment yes. you have any spin which is larger than spin one, so larger than spin half, you have quadrupole moments. Yes, spin exactly. Spin one has quadrupole moments. So yes, exactly. this game is about quadrupolar interaction on the charge side or on the spin side or both? On the spin side. Oh, on the spin side, I see. Exactly. But when you talk about the size, uh, it's about uh, the charge or the spin? <laughs> It's again about the spin. Uh, so the size relates to the, so the size exactly is twice the spin. And we can, so like Barry mentioned it, uh, you can think of macroscopicity as how separated the two things are. So uh, for a spin, like a, a system with eight dimensions, there would be seven transitions. So that's how you can think of the size as seven. That's the separation between the lowest right. and the it's highest. It's not the physical size. It's, it's not the size of the nucleus. Because no. the size of the nucleus itself, you know, has, because the charge distribution, there is a charge distribution, there is a quadrupole moment or higher yes. moments because of that, which also quantifies the size of the physical size of this. This is oh. not about, it's the size of the spin, I think. Right? That's how yes. we should understand. Okay. Yes, okay. yes. 
so that's uh, one of the things that it's a uh, physically small system, but uh, sort of quantumly large because of the spin. Yeah, another way to think of it is the um, it's the size of the phase space. So you have a block sphere, okay. coherent states on the block sphere are just lumps at say the North and South Pole. And then the question is how big is this planet? You know, so um, Pragati is now working with the Jupiter of, of the coherence. <laughs> So thanks a lot again, and uh, thank you very much for your talk. So we move on. Um, uh, so the next speaker uh, is Just Professor Ujwal Sen. Yeah. Um, is Ujwal here? Ah, great. Hi. So there's no